Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckheads join me shortly in our topics this week. There may be candor in the mayor's race, an apparent lack of candor in the immigration debate, and a continuing debate about Secretary Kobach, plus roast and toast. But we're going to start with our newsmaker segment and focus on what's going on at Kansas City, Missouri City Hall, where there is always a potpourri of issues to think about and talk about. And joining me for that conversation is Councilman Scott Wagner. He was elected at large, that is citywide, to represent the 1st District, and he also serves as Mayor Pro Tem. Councilman Wagner is among the many who are talking about running for mayor next year. Councilman, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for coming in. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Now, you represent the 1st District that is mostly north of the river, Clay County? Uh, yeah, the, north of the river and kind of on the east side uh, of the Northland, yep. And Mayor Pro Tem means what? Uh, I stand in when the mayor is unavailable, so uh, that can mean everything from uh, going to speak at events that he can't speak at, uh, running the council meetings when he's unavailable, and otherwise being the, uh, the guy in charge if he is unavailable. Uh, as you probably know, uh, KCPT has been running a lot of public affairs programs about affordable housing mm -hmm. and about eviction. You're on the council's housing committee. Mm -hmm. I know you're very involved. What's the council doing with regard to affordable housing and what's its role? Well, I think its role is to figure out what it has to do to expand the capacity for those who want to build affordable housing. As we've had discussions related to uh, the state really no longer being in that business, although that may change now that we have a new governor. The reality is that there are individuals who are spending a whole lot of their income to put a roof over their heads. And I think uh, what we have to do and what we're talking about through our housing policy policy, which we hope to see a draft of uh, next month, uh, is to really see how best we can use our finite dollars to help provide more affordable housing opportunities to people all over the city. So there is a city role in providing affordable housing? Well, I think there's a city role, not necessarily in building that housing, but to assist others who are trying to provide that housing. And you're proposing something called the Rental Property Inspection Plan? So we have the Healthy Homes uh, Initiative that would provide those uh, rental, uh, rental inspections. Um, many cities around this country have it. Uh, Kansas City does not. Uh, we currently have an inability to respond to individuals who call the city and say, hey, I want uh, my uh, house looked at, uh, because the only time we really can at this point is if there is an emergency situation. So think um, the police are called for something, the fire department is called for something, they get in there, they see something, and if it looks like a detrimental public health hazard, then they call us in. We'd rather get there before that happens. That's a big day for you on KCPT. You're on Ruckus, and you're also featured, I understand, on uh, a program tonight airing right after the Ruckus program mm -hmm. about eviction. Mm -hmm. It is put together by Michael Price. It's a documentary. He does great work. And again, that's on right after Ruckus tonight on KCPT. Mm -hmm. um, you're running for mayor. Why do you want that job? Because uh, I'm not finished with what I started as a councilman. Uh, before I ran, I was the neighborhood president for the Indian Mound neighborhood. I decided that if you're going to do more for the neighborhood, you have to be in a position to do more. After eight years, there's still many more things to do for neighborhoods, and so I want uh, to run uh, for mayor. I find that there is a tremendous difference between mayor being mayor pro tem and being mayor, as you can well imagine. And so, yes, you have to why. be elected mayor, and you're appointed uh, mayor pro tem. You've got it. You have got it. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, some people seem to think the race is over because Jason Kander declared that he's going to run. I take it you don't believe it's over yet? Uh, well, there's a little thing called an election <laughs> that has to happen before anyone becomes mayor or anything else. And I think as we have found uh, just as uh just as late as the primaries in some of the states around the country that the person who is coronated is not exactly the person who is elected. And so my feeling is uh, everyone who wants to run for mayor has to present their vision, their ideas, and how they plan to do things, and then they will make the decision. Let me ask you a quick question to get a quick answer almost out of time. How likely is it we're going to get federal money for the streetcar expansion? Uh, I would put it 50-50. 
And do you like the way these elections are being conducted for streetcar expansion? Uh, they are perfectly within the state law. Now, if we want to get more people involved, I think there is nothing wrong with getting more people involved in voting for things. But at the end of the day, um, whether I like it or not, it's up to the state law to decide. Councilman, thank you very much for coming in. Always a pleasure to talk with you, and good luck in the mayor's campaign. Thank you very much. And that was Kansas City, Missouri Councilman Scott Wagner. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jamika Kendricks is an educator and education activist. Attorney Laura McConwell is a former mayor of Mission, Kansas. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Woody Kozad is head of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. It's great to have all of you here with us for the program. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. It is quite a jump from thinking about running for president in 2020 to running for mayor of Kansas City, Missouri in 2019. But that seems to be what happened with Jason Kander, a former Democratic state rep and Missouri Secretary of State. Kander, a Kansas Citian, ran for the U.S. Senate in 2016, but lost a close battle with the incumbent Roy Blunt. He's been traveling around the country on behalf of his nonprofit, Let America Vote, and perhaps assessing his presidential possibilities. Jumping into the mayor's race, Kander faces a crowded field, including businessmen and women, and several current council members. It is way too early to know, but never too early to speculate. So does Jason Kander have a good shot at becoming the next mayor of Kansas City? We'll start with Mary. Oh, I think he has about as good a, a shot as anybody could possibly have, uh, particularly since uh, Jolie Justice, the councilwoman from the 4th District, decided to, to, to leave the race. And uh, they, they worked out a deal, as, it, as the saying goes. Well, I think Jason Kander is, is an uh, exciting entrance into the race. Jason is, uh, I know him very personally. I, I supported him in his first race. And I'll never forget Mike uh, working for him at the polls in that first race for the state legislature in South Kansas City. I've never seen people coming to vote who were more excited about having the opportunity to vote for, for somebody for uh, the state legislature. Um, he is, you know, he's had eight years in the Army as the intelligence officer in the United States Army. Eight years in public life, legislature, executive position in the, in the Secretary of State's office. And in 2016, when Trump wiped the slate clean for Democrats in Missouri, he received more votes on the Kansas City ballots than anybody. Let me move over here so, to Woody for just a second. Uh, you know, it seems to me in some past elections, the person who was anointed to be the next mayor uh, did not turn out to be the next mayor. Well, that has happened before in Kansas City. Where the voters here can be uh, obstreperous and think that it's up to them. Uh, <laughs> what a, very what a presumptuous of them, very presumptuous of them. Uh, look, I, I, I think I agree with Mary, though. I think he has the, the best shot right now. He can raise a lot of money. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really struck by this. I admire his courage. There are only two possible outcomes. One is he loses the mayor's race. That makes him a two-time loser. That isn't good in politics. Uh, or maybe worse still, he wins the race. Then you're the mayor of a major American city. That has not been the place to be if you wanted a career further career in politics in the past. Uh, under Mayor James, we've had a kind of an era of good feelings. I think that is personal to the mayor. I don't think the, his successor inherits that. What you do inherit is a staggering debt, a tax load that is greater than other comparable cities have, and a crime rate that is a national scandal. And people on the left tend not to have ideas for reducing debt, reducing taxes, or in fact for reducing crime. Uh, Jamaica, if the election were occurring now instead of next year, what would be a couple of the major issues? Um, some issues that I would like to see. Um, I think tax increment financing is going to be one because it's been huge around the impact that it has on education in Kansas City. I also would like for us to begin to have a real conversation about the impact that Regent regentrification has on our community um, where we divest in low-income 
uh, communities of color generally and invest in middle class white communities. And I'd like for us to have a conversation about that because I think one of the things that harms Kansas City the most is that we do have these pockets where um, we are thriving and then we have other pockets where we kind of try and hide it and say, don't go there because we've not invested. And these issues will still be around next year and all that. Absolutely. Uh, Laura, you're the only person in the room who has actually been a mayor of a city. You were the mayor of Mission, Kansas, elected three times. What advice would you give to the next mayor of Kansas City, whoever that turns out to be? I'm going to follow up with what he said about uh, Mayor James right now, and I think he's demonstrated a lot of grace under pressure and mm -hmm. perseverance and a willingness to listen. And he, I believe, is a, is a real public servant because he, he likes Kansas City and likes the people he represents, whether they're like him or they're, they're not like him. And I think you're, as a mayor, that's what you have to do. You've got you to gotta love what you're doing. You've you got to love your community and the people in it. And you can't just be, look at being the mayor as, well, what's the next thing I'm going to run for? Let me put up a list of the people who now say that they are going to run for mayor. And I'll ask Mary to name a couple <laughs> who might uh, have a good shot in addition to Mr. Kander. There's Jason Kander, Scott Wagner, Alyssa, Alicia, I'm sorry, Kennedy, Scott Taylor, Jermaine Reed, Stephen Miller, Phil Glenn, Rita Berry, and Quentin Lucas. Name two or three among those, Mary, who uh, might be strong candidates. Well, I think Mr. Miller is He's liked an attorney. and uh, respected around town. He's a former highway commissioner in the uh, state of Missouri. Uh, well, had a Lucas. successful Lucas fundraiser Lucas is a bright guy. Night. Quentin Lucas, a bright guy. Uh, well, yes, of course. He has a wonderful education. I think that he's liked. I don't know him. I don't know... But I think he's played an active role in recent uh, activity around the airport. Um, you know, Scott Wagner is a, is a guy who really has served the, the community and served the city. Um, you know, Kansas City loves its mayors, and we have been blessed with one exception. Yeah. <laughs> with really and wonderful By the way, mayors. one of the former mayors, Kay Barnes, was honored the other day by having, what, a big ballroom named uh, Well, and she behalf. said she didn't mind having a room named <laughs> after her, but I think Grand Boulevard would have been yeah. a better All idea. All right, we've got to move ahead. <laughs> it must have been a frustrating moment for and Kansas <laughs> Secretary of State and GOP gubernatorial candidate Chris Kobach when federal judge Julie Robinson struck down the state law requiring proof of citizenship to register to vote. The law was fashioned, championed, and defended by Kobach. Adding salt to the wound, Judge Robinson ordered the Yale, Harvard, and Oxford trained attorney to take six hours of legal education because of his behavior or perhaps misbehavior during the trial. Kobach is appealing the citizenship ruling and presumably planning to undergo the training. So, Laura, will this defeat in court have any impact on Kobach's support in the gubernatorial primary, where his major opponent seems to be the current governor, Jeff Collier? No, I don't think so. I think Chris has a base, and the, the, the sanction that the court ordered against him is probably only going to justify his base because he keeps talking about how terrible the ju judiciary is and the people that aren't going to support him aren't going to support him. I don't think that that specifically is a game changer because in that ruling there, there are two separate issues. The one issue has to do with the substance, which was the voter registration. The other issue had to do with actual procedural missteps that Chris took during that, during the litigation. And just because he has that nice pedigree of Harvard, Oxford, and Yale doesn't mean he's actually mm -hmm. been in a courtroom very much. And I, in fact, I don't believe he has. He's been an Oakland Park City Councilman. He's been Secretary of State. He's been... Um, he was a Republican state party person. He's been a professor, but he really well, hasn't he been a practicing from attorney. Going back to school, if he's yes. kind of ignorant well, of the she, rules. she directed him to do <laughs> six hours of CLE specifically right. on civil procedure. Uh, Mary, as shocking <laughs> as the yes vote on streetcar expansion was, equally shocking was the Kansas State Supreme Court saying the legislature had failed to provide enough money for. K to 12 education. Shocking. Were you satisfied with this court ruling? I was more than satisfied. You know, you know, the far right, uh, the Republican Party wants is getting ready to do their constitutional amendment thing. But the fact of the matter is, the last time the people of Kansas had a chance to vote, they voted strongly in favor of supporting the basic right of the court to settle disputes 
about uh, school finance because it's in the Constitution. The greatest constitution. Well, greatest Mary, constitution of course, you can country. change a constitution by <laughs> passing Woody a constitutional you amendment. Can. That's what Chris Kobach and other Republican conservatives in Kansas are talking about: transferring the authority from deciding how much is enough from the court to the elected officials. Well, I think if that's all they're seeking to do, they may very well lose. Well. What they should have done was copy Missouri. Nobody in Kansas ever wants to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but the Missouri Constitution says you've got to spend 25% of general revenue on K-12 through education. And our Supreme Court ruled when they had this kind of challenge, we want another billion dollars. They said, look, as long as they hit the 25%, it's none of the court's business. And that takes them out of it, but it also guarantees public education a certain level of funding. And so I think you take the present level, add 1% to it, and it's an increase for public education, and everybody runs to the polls and votes. Well, for and the court gave the legislature a year. Uh, the legislature yes. apparently is spending money fairly, but just not enough money, according to the court. Were you pleased by this decision? You're strong on education yes, support. Yes, I was. Um, I... Like Mary, I appreciate the fact that the Kansas voters said we do want the court to be involved and for the court to be able to set um, what is expected to be spent on education. And so, yeah, I was pleased. Well, I mean, to me, this has to do more with the balance. You've got an executive, you've got a judiciary, and you have a legislature. And the function of the judiciary, you know, isn't to make the laws, but the function of the judiciary is to make sure that the legislature is following the Constitution. And so that's what the the, the court has done. The court has never come in and said what a dollar amount is. Yes, and exactly. so I think that's a, that's an important thing. And I think the Kansans, Kansans respect that balance of power by and large. And, and uh, you know, uh, they could have ordered them to pay up right now. But, you know, saying, uh, we'll it, give you a year, see what you can do, adjust the uh, taxes. Back to Kobach's court appearance, uh, his concerns about voter fraud are shared by Missouri's Secretary of State. <sighs> Jay Ashcroft, son of John, he calls fraud an exponentially greater threat than hacking. Is that's, he simply uninformed or a right-wing extremist? That statement or? is itself fraudulent. Yes, that is an amazing, Absolutely. strange one of those. I mean, right out of the Kovacs paper. Well, you know, we're way in on the of Jay Ashcroft. In my political lifetime, three state representative elections have been stolen in Kansas City that I know of. And uh, one of them recently won back in, two of them back in the mid-80s in, in, in the same election, two They're rep stolen districts. by voter fraud. Yes, absolutely. Oh, come on. Absolutely. And you have evidence for this. Because oh, when I yes. look, there was no yeah. evidence of an no election evidence. ever being stolen. And Rizzo's all of the comprehensive election? And all of Rizzo's the comp first house and election? All of the comprehensive when his relatives crossed about into voter district election to fraud, they have he, never found that an election has been stolen. Vote. His uncle voted and his and uncle him crossed <laughs> into his district to vote when he wasn't a resident if, there. If you There's all, no doubt the election If you all come to order, please. I'm going to move on. Many believe that Donald Trump is president today because he vowed to stop illegal immigration and build a big, beautiful wall along the southern border. Trump's latest effort to enforce the law, a zero-tolerance policy, was met by outrage from Democrats and others who called the policy of separating parents and children at the border immoral, unjust, cruel, and racist. In response, Trump issued an executive order stopping the separations, but sowing confusion about how to get the job done. Complicating the issue, an earlier federal court ruling that limits how long a child can be held. Efforts to craft immigration reform measures have had little to no success in the U.S. Congress. So how and when will these issues get resolved, I ask you, Jamaica? Um, I think that they will be resolved when... Um just like in every thing, when our executive leaders actually listen to those who are responsible for implementing their mandates or those who are affected by it. And I think in this situation, um, the resolution did not do that because the issue here is the capacity of Custom and Border Control um, or Border Patrol and of the Department of Justice to be able to handle um, the number of cases that are going to be prosecuted for folks crossing over. And in the past, they haven't been prosecuted. They've either been sent back to their country or been paroled in here and uh, to to uh, wait to see uh, 
if they were able to come over legally. So um, now we're sitting back and we're uh, and we're prosecuting everyone. And the issue is not. And the issue is that they don't have enough judges and enough folks to actually prosecute these cases. And children can't be held indefinitely. So if you're prosecuting all of these cases and you don't have enough folks to do it, kids will be held so indefinitely. So what should you do? Let people just come in? I think you should listen to the folks who are who are talking to you and saying these are the issues we have. So how do we address those issues and still secure the border? There is a compromise somewhere in there, but it takes us listening and coming to consensus you, around the issue have, rather than just can, doing can what we Can you share that compromise with us? <laughs> because I'm not of. sitting there talking to the no, folks it, who are okay, giving the information, I can't. The same question. I think the controversy is obvious. You've got to get actual border security on the one hand, and then in return for that, the Republicans have to do something at the minimum about these DACA people. So you take that the Democrats give on border security, which they really don't want any of, and the Republicans have to give on some of the people who are a lot of the people who are already here. That's your deal. Once you've got actual border security, then the Republicans can all go home and relax. If you don't get that, this issue goes on forever. I, I do say this. We've been separating these folks for quite some time. It suddenly became an issue when they actually had an immigration reform bill that looked like the Republican caucus would support it and the president would sign it. And that's when this became an issue. And I don't think that's a coincidence. And they killed the bill. Do you think if, if President Trump got the money to build the wall that he'd be more flexible on these other matters? No. President Trump on this issue is a disgrace. An absolute, well, Mary, that's the issue he ran on, though. Uh, the, 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 the issue of, it, of the children... The issue of illegal immigration. Really, let's, let's take the kids, okay? And having, have, having bo ordering border officers to go up and grab children away from their parents and putting them in tents out in the desert. And now we're going... He has ordered the Navy to prepare for 20,000 people to be moved out of the regular border control and their and their auspices to the Navy and become wards of the uh, United States military. This thing is so out of control and so anti-American and unconstitutional. That, that, is that because Good so many the, people are coming in from Guatemala? You know, Honduras, really, and El it Salvador? hasn't it's increased. As a matter of fact, it hasn't increased. It hasn't increased. No. Uh, uh, immigration was actually down last year. What has increased is the need of the President of the United States no. to no. make uh, this and, and Unless I'm mistaken, let's there has been a what? surge of people from yeah. Honduras, well, Nicar uh, there's a, there are El Salvador, reasons, right? and Guatemala. Probably Guatemala. The first one, it, look, it was down for several years, yeah. or flat, because the net of people leaving who were here illegally and those coming in was about the same, because we had a great recession. There weren't a lot of jobs available. Now the economy's booming, the attraction to get here has increased, and you would then expect that there would be a rise in the now, number of people trying to get in. And everything that I've read, it said that there was no increase, and that instead there was an increase in the number of prosecutions and the number of families separated due to prosecutions, and that's what made headlines. So it's not that there are more people coming over, we're handling it different. And, and, so, and how you handle it affects how many people try and come. You, well, there's that. Well, we have. I don't. I don't think that's true. And oh, I think yes, we've handled. Is. We, how is it true? Why do we have a law to prosecute murder? Because we you, hope it deters so people. So when from you murder. said we were in a recession, <laughs> that there were fewer people coming over. Right. To we get were a handling job. it. We weren't handling it this way then. And there were fewer people ah, coming over. So no why are we going back to the way we were doing it with, before? Uh, with because, Laura, be, do you know if we're no longer in a recession? Is there a Democratic? Party position on illegal immigration? You know, I I don't know. Mary, do you know? Well, there's a there. Of course, there. Uh, what is, is it? Uh, well, the, the the position of the party for a long time has been we need a comprehensive immigration okay. reform in the Congress of the United States, and they have simply shoved their responsibility out the door. We've got to stop it there. Out, out, <laughs> running out of time. The now Republican we're going to head to the soapbox <laughs> for roast and toast, where the Ruckets have 30 okay. seconds each to charm, alarm, or disarm, okay. and we start with Woody. Mm -hmm. uh, a toast. A toast to every conservative's new best friend forever, former Senator Harry Reid, who, in his <laughs> desire to bully through one of uh, President Obama's nominees, changed the rules in the Senate on confirmation of Supreme Court nominees. And thus, it will take exactly 50 Republican votes in the Senate in order to confirm whomever uh, the president nominates. And for this, we are all grateful. Thanks for the legacy, Harry. <laughs> 
and those hearings will be great fun to watch. Uh, <laughs> Jamaica. Okay, I'm going to surprise Trump and pro I mean uh, Mike and probably several other people who watch, and I am going to toast President Trump and Betsy DeVos, and not because I think they're doing great things, but I think the conversations that are being had because of moves that they are making are important ones that will make a difference in education. And the one that is most recent is the combination of the Department of Education and um, the Depart Workforce. And so I really appreciate the conversations that are being had. I'm hoping something good comes out of it. I may need resuscitation. <laughs> uh, Mary. Me too. Uh, I would like to toast uh, a, a couple from uh, San Diego, actually, is where they're from. Dave and Charlotte Whitmer. And Dave and Charlotte Whitmer were so moved by the side of small children without their parents being shuffled off to, to really suffer in cages somewhere in the desert. And the whole saga is that, it, that ran out. And what they did was go on Facebook and say, we want to raise money for a couple of attorneys to help the children we know about. The response of the people in the United States was an immediate one. They now have $25 million. Let me stop to, you there because of time. Laura, do you have a quick one? Well, yeah, I'm going to roast uh, Daniel Ortega, who is the president of Nicaragua, who's, out been, who's been, for the last month or so have created discord in his country and have been shooting students because they want to have access to good education and fair elections and a lot of the things we take for granted in this country. Okay, and that's Ruckus for this week. We're off next week because of the 4th of July holiday, back on Thursday, July the 12th at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.